first speaker is Dr. Peter Patmore. Let me introduce um, Dr. Patmore to you. Uh, the Honourable Dr. Peter Patmore AM was educated at Queechee High School and the Universities of Tasmania and Cambridge. He was admitted as a barrister and solicitor in 1978. A member of the Tasmanian House of Assembly from 1984 to 2002, he held various portfolios including Deputy Premier and Attorney General. From 2002 until 2015, he was Chairman of the Poppy Control and Advisory Board um, and an Australian Delegate to the United Nations Conference on Narcotic Drugs. He is the Academic Coordinator and Lecturer for the University of Tasmania Parliamentary Law and Practice for Australian and New Zealand Parliamentary Clerks and past coordinator for professional development to the parliaments of Samoa and the Solomon Islands. He was awarded the Australian Medal um, AM in 2005. Um, that's the member actually, the AM would be a member of the Order of Australia in 2005 for services to the Tasmanian Parliament, particularly through the introduction of fiscal education and law reforms. Will you please welcome Dr. Peter Panmore. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, good morning, everyone. I've, I've lost a bet. I uh, asked my wife to come along because I said you'd be the only one here this time of the morning, so I got it wrong. Um, my topic um, is pretty well, you could regard as a boring one, um, in that a previous Prime Minister, uh, Menzies, penned a poem about the clerks and his poem went along the lines of, two wise old owls sat at the table, their wigs were grey, their gowns were sable. They looked so sad, so melancholy, as if depressed by human folly. And that too, uh, in many ways, sums up the attitude or the view that people have of clerks and people say, who the hell are clerks? What do they do? And my point I'd like you to think about this morning is it, it's, it's not so much who the clerks are, but what they do and how they tie in with, with issues such as separations of powers and uh, the doctrine of responsible government. And so their role is unacknowledged. Uh, we see on the television occasionally when Parliament opens, you'll see someone bashing on the, on the wall, of, on the door of the, uh, the chambers to be, to be let in. You will uh, see them down below, the, the Speaker or the President, uh, doing their work. So who are they? But let's, let's deal with the basics first. We're talking about an organisation that really started on the, in about 1313. That's quite a lengthy history for an organisation. The first clerk of the House of Commons was appointed in 1363. And their role was basically to read and write because the members of parliament were, and some still are, illiterate. <laughs> so they needed to be told what the order of business was and what was going on. That was their, pre that was their prime, prime job. And of course the first clerks for, uh, for the federal parliament was 1901. They're the only non-elected people in parliament who speak. They can read out the business, orders of the day, so they're the only people who aren't elected who have a non-speaking role. But their main role is really, I would say, procedural and advisory. They would meet with the President or the uh, Speaker uh, every morning when Parliament sits, but they have a role greater than that. So if we're talking clerks, what are they? Are they fish? Are they fowl? Um, are they, what, what do you call them? Are they public servants? Are they officers of Parliament? Or something else? So let's try and work out what they are. But before we do that, let's, let's go to the two, I think, underpinning doctrines that, that, under, you know, that, that make them who they are. First one, very quickly move over, is separation of powers. What's that got to do with the clerks? Now, as we know, separations of powers um, really isn't in Australia. I, my contention is we don't have a real clear separation of powers in Australia, not like the Americans where we have the executive, the, you know, the legislature and, and the judiciary. Now, the arguments we've had, obviously, have been for separation of powers with the judiciary. There, there is a clear-cut uh, delineation between the judiciary and parliament. But, of course, 
the founding fathers didn't look at this concept of, of, of a clear separation. They, they, did, they weren't so keen on the American system. American system really, as uh, Justice Brandes uh, pointed out here, I'll just read how he saw the American system. The doctrine of separation of powers was adopted by the Convention of 1787, not to promote efficiency, but to preclude the exercise of arbitrary power. The purpose was not to avoid friction, but by means of inevitable friction incident to the distribution of government powers among the three departments to save the people from autocracy. Of course, a significant minority of the convention members in Australia, uh, delegates, wanted to adopt the uh, American position. But our colleague here, uh, Samuel Griffiths, argued against it. And um, he said, uh, the, he spoke about the unwisdom of having ministers disassociated and the executive government entirely disassociated from the legislature. So separation of powers we don't have because, of course, you've got to be a member of parliament to be in the executive, unlike America. So, therefore, Samuel Griffiths wanted a system of responsible government, responsible government where the executive is accountable to parliament and only holds power as long as it has the confidence of the parliament. Now, because of that, there have been problems and we have seen the growth of the influence of the executive over consecutive decades. And many in power believe that the lower house is subordinate to the party room uh, of the government executive. And therefore, government of the day has sometimes formed the view <coughs> that its role is really managing parliament rather than being accountable to parliament. And if the concept of responsible government has to have any meaning at all, you need an executive that is accountable to parliament. But of course, here's another quote on this. It says, the dominance of the executive is entrenched by party discipline, procedural control, a monopoly of information and advice, increasing government complexity and workload, and the scarcity of parliamentary time. So if you have that, how does a parliament become, uh, enable it to be accountable? So essentially, if you're going to have accountability at all for a backbench, for an independent member, for an opposition, they need assistance and they need advice. And they need advice that is independent, confidential and impartial to allow them to have sufficient ability to question the government of the day. And this is where I'd suggest that the public service and the clerks come in. Now, we've all heard the, uh, the, the talk about how public servants are impartial uh, and to, in their advice. Well, yeah, technically, you could say public servants are impartial and you'd say they're apolitical. But it's a pretty highly defined impartiality because their role is to provide advice having regard to the government of the day's policies and agenda. They are not neutral between the government and the government's opponents, and they are in fact obliged to serve the government party often against the interests of its opponents. So an impartial public servant really is only impartial to the level that he or she can't do their job if their view of politics is such that they can't serve the government of the day. So obviously they can't assist the opposition, they can't assist backbenchers. So what about clerks? Can they assist? Can they help? How do we categorise them? They're not public servants, obviously. Are they, in fact, officers of parliament? And if they are, how do you, how do you classify them? Now, when we talk about officers of parliament, the first thing that springs to mind are not clerks, it's the ombudsman or the auditor general. But there's immediate differences, aren't there, between clerks and auditors general? Because the first two, their role is that of examining the actions of the executive and reporting to parliament. Clerks don't have a reporting role and their role is not to examine the actions of the government. 
So what are they? Are they <coughs> sufficiently independent to be called officers of parliament? Now, <coughs> the gentleman who follows me, Ken Colquhill, um, has given me a nice little list of how we determine whether they're going to be independent. Now, Ken's view is you can, you can call someone independent if by the way in which they're appointed, by their tenure, and by their statutory independence. And you look at those and say, well, yeah, maybe they do. So let's, how do we work it out? So some are statutorily appointed. Some have a clear tenure, limited tenure. For example, in the Commonwealth Parliament, it's a 10-year non-renewable term. Others can be removed by the Speaker. Others need uh, a, movement of, uh, a motion of both Houses of Parliament. As far as independence go, federally, a clerk is not subject to the direction of the chair in relation to advice sought by other members. Statutory, the clerks are independent of the chair. They cannot be told by the chair to give advice or not to give advice to other members. So in relation to appointment, tenure and independence, you'd say that in fact they are officers of parliament. But there's a caveat on that. Now, <clears throat> Professor Wanner a recently commented on the dispute between the President of the Human Rights Commission, Julian Triggs, and the federal government. And in that, in that speech he gave, he gave a clear warning, and he stated the following. One of the dimensions of statutory independence is for the office holder to retain the respect and confidence of the parliament. And that includes the executive in our Westminster system. Uh, Bob, if I may ask a favour, if you could uh, tell me five minutes before my time runs out, because I don't have a watch, I don't want to. Um, so Dr Solomon also reviewed Queensland developments on the basis of the criminal justice system. And he highlighted the fact that the ability, the executive has an ability to change the roles and functions of officers of parliament, and they can do it by way of legislation. So the bottom line is that a clerk's only, although they may have independence, or they may have tenure, or they, you know, they may be independent, they're only as independent and only there as long as the executive wants them to be because they can change legislation. In fact, there's one rumour that, in fact, uh, one of the clerks of the Senate uh, was responsible for the 10-year non-renewable non tenure for clerks now because the government wanted to get rid of him. So, therefore, if you're going to retain the respect of the executive, you need to be impartial and you need to make sure that you deal with members in an impartial manner. And, of course, members themselves often don't understand the requirement of the need for independence of the clerks. And they make it difficult. But to a clerk, their view is that the Member of Parliament is a client, not a friend, a client. And one of the quotes here was, an advisor who tells the client what the client wants to hear and supports every course of action suggested by the client is not only useless but dangerous. That's a quote of one of the clerks. So therefore, we can work out the following. Clerks as officers of parliament have independence from the executive. They provide confidential advice to all members of parliament. They are not subject to the direction of presiding officers. And their position is protected from the government to some degree, but only as long as their work is held in high regard by the parliament. And in this respect, they fiercely protect their ethos and their abilities. Now, <clears throat> why is this important? Usually the average staff turnover for a clerk is about 12 years minimum. Now that's a pretty slow uh, progression of employment, isn't it? You've got to be patient. But it also means in that period of time you're going to build up experience. Now why is that, why is that important? OK, I looked at the, uh, the, the breakdown of members of parliament. So for the 43rd parliament, 65% of the members had less than 12 years' experience. This is federally. 44th parliament, 25% of the members from the reps and 18% of the senators were new. Now, I don't have the breakup of the current 
new parliament, but I can guarantee that percentage is going to be higher. So obviously there is a lack of corporate knowledge by many members of parliament, and that corporate knowledge is held by the clerks. And if you are going to maintain the integrity of parliament, if you are going to maintain this, this, this whole concept of, of separation, of, sorry, of responsible government, you need someone who holds that ability and is held in sufficiently high regard that they can be tapped into when they're needed. Now, often they will give unwanted advice and unwelcome advice. And uh, I found some examples in relation to that. Uh, uh, Clive Palmer caused a bit of a problem uh, in 2014, only one of many problems in 2014. In the Senate he wanted uh, amendments distributed that were effectively money bills and of course couldn't originate in the Senate. Uh, he didn't quite get this concept around his head and uh, got involved with the clerk, uh, Dr Lang, who quite rightly said in more polite terms than I'd use. Sorry, Senator, uh, sorry uh, uh, Mr Palmer, but we can't do that. He uh, got very upset about that. Uh, her email to the staff was, quote, none of you need have any contact with the member in question if you feel at all threatened or intimidated by him. And the, to his credit, the, uh, as I understand it, the President of the Senate backed him, back, backed her. And in 2014, the clerks even got, in, got themselves involved in a brawl with the House of Commons. Uh, at that stage, there was a, uh, an internecine warfare between the Speaker of the House of Commons, John Burkhart, and uh, the retiring clerk. And Burko, or the Speaker Burko, wanted to uh, upgrade, change uh, the way in which the role of the clerks and the speakers were running. And he uh, wanted someone with managerial experience to take the clerk's job. And it, we found that the Australian Secretary of the Department of Parliamentary Service, Carol Mills, was front runner for the job. She had managerial experience. She didn't have any real parliamentary experience. So the Australian clerks saw red and uh, contacted the House of Commons. At this stage, there was a six-member uh, selection panel and they'd recommended she take the job. And uh, also the clerk, for the, sorry, the speaker for the first time since 1363 advertised the position. And I think that upset the clerk more than anything. So, but the, Dr Lang's email is very in, in, incisive in the way in which they perceive their role. And she said, it seems to us impossible that someone without parliamentary knowledge and experience could be under consideration for such a role. She continued that there wasn't one of her colleagues who, quote, who has not seen this candidacy as an affront to our profession and the professionalism of us all. So that's pretty, pretty big fighting words for the clerk member, the quiet, boring clerks. And Dr Lang expanded her comments by saying that the departmental secretary did not have an appreciation or respect for the status of the role of members. She basically said that Carol Mills was too beholden to the speaker and the president and was not sufficiently independent. Uh, all hell broke loose. Uh, Carol Mills didn't get the job. And an Australian clerk uh, got herself quite correctly inserted into a rather large dispute in the House of Commons. So it shows a couple of things there, doesn't it? It shows the need for clerks to have suitable parliamentary experience, it shows the need for them to be independent, and it shows the need for them to give advice when it's not wanted. And this is, I think, encapsulates it. Of course, the question is, if they are so keen on giving independent advice, can they become subject to what I call a Stockholm Syndrome? In other words, can they, give her can they tender advice that, for their own chamber, when really the advice should be for the other chamber? It's not, I'm not making myself clear. It's Sunday morning, so I'll go into, uh, into that. I'll give the example of the Children Overboard affair. It ended up, in, amongst other things, into a brawl between the powers of the Senate and the House of Representatives. 
The uh, Senate inquiry into the Children Overboard Affair wanted to summons uh, members and ex-members from the House of Reps to the Senate to uh, give uh, evidence. There was a dispute between the House of Representatives and the Senate. The House of Representatives were of the view that members and ex-members could not be summonsed. The Senate clerk was of the view that, in fact, they could be summonsed. So we had a bit of an indication in these emails, these letters going backwards and forwards, of hairs on the back of the neck standing up a bit. So this is, um, this is what the House of Reps, uh, Ian Evans, he was, uh, sorry, Ian Harris, the clerk of the House of Reps said, in the absence of any decisions of the House, unelected officials do not have the power to assert with any finality the practices of the House in question. My attitude would always be to regard myself as a servant of the House for which I work and not as a determinator of its practices. In other words, get back in your box. Um, the clerk of the Senate wrote back and said, Mr Harris's letter contains serious misrepresentations of the actions of the Senate. These, these misrepresentations had several more layers of confusion over the issues. Harris wasn't having any of that. He wrote back, over the years I've noted a number of occasions when the clerk of the Senate has responded to comments by people who have a different opinion to his own with accusations of misrepresentation being confused and creating confusion and being bellicose. The ploy seems designed to give weight to the Senate clerk's opinions by personal attacks on those who think differently. So they, were, they weren't on each other's Christmas card list, it's pretty obvious. And in the end it, 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 it faded out and the question of the ability to summons was never really uh, uh, pushed. I have my own views in relation to that but I won't go into it. But it certainly shows that the clerks were taking a position partisan to their own chamber. The question I leave open is, what would have happened if their roles had been reversed? Would they still argue the same? I think perhaps they wouldn't. So, where are we in conclusion? There is a creeping power of the executive and there is a creeping tendency of the executive to regard Parliament as a hindrance rather than a force of accountability. The opposition and independent members, if they are to fully carry out their role in forcing accountability upon an executive, must have complete faith that they have a source of independent, confidential advice to assist them in their role of keeping the executive accountable to Parliament. The fact that the advice may be counter to the agenda of the government is irrelevant. A properly operating parliament ensures accountability of the executive and government. Unlike public servants, clerks are beholden to parliament and are clearly officers of parliament with elements of tenure, independence and parliamentary rather than government appointment. Their role goes beyond purely administrative and advisory and although not immediately observable to the casual observer, they are vital in supporting the concepts of responsible government. They are holders of Parliament's corporate knowledge. They provide valuable advice to members, many of which are newly elected. They contribute to the smooth operation of Parliament and individually advise members so the institution of Parliament and the concept of responsible government operates as efficiently as possible. The advice can be given freely in the knowledge that the institution of Parliament protects the clerk's position. But this is not a position or a protection granted without condition. To retain the respect of Parliament and all members, clerks are reliant on their professionalism and their interaction with members. They must be at arm's length from members and regard their interactions as ones of client advisor. As uh, one retired clerk uh, summed it up by telling me, he said, we are friendly to everyone, but we are friends with no one. Thank you.